video will explore America's use of tobacco as currency. In colonial America, tobacco was one of the most influential crops in cultivation. Colonies like Virginia profited heavily from its agricultural success. The successful cultivation of tobacco began when John Rolfe planted South American tobacco seeds in 1612. From there, tobacco production spread from the Tidewater area to the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia, especially dominating the agriculture of the Chesapeake region. Tobacco became such a huge commodity that the Virginia House of Burgesses made it a requirement for tobacco to be inspected and directed the construction of warehouses and port towns where tobacco would be brought by planters. As tobacco became more valuable, its uses expanded from smoking to use as currency. It was used for just about anything, paying taxes, purchasing manufactured goods and items from the local store. Tobacco itself became a source of social currency as well as money. It became a way of paying off your accounts and a way of paying others, who then purchased items at the store using someone else's tobacco as payment. This was done through documents called crop notes. Tobacco was accepted by all of the major commercial players in colonial America. And while other colonies such as Pennsylvania and Delaware preferred to have land as payment, in Virginia, Maryland, and North Carolina, tobacco was currency. Tobacco could be paid in hogsheads, which are barrels, and they could be paid to different vendors to purchase fabrics, cotton, bearskin, linen, German Sergei, ferret, check, and buckra. Tobacco opened up a new world of possibilities for American colonists, and it widened the range of its uses as time passed. People not only used their own tobacco as currency, but they exchanged tobacco for goods or paid other people with the crop, who then used it as currency in the local economy. So in this way, tobacco went from being a cash crop to a social crop. It brought individuals, families, and communities together. Tobacco was not only the most valuable crop through financial means, but also culturally. Tobacco became its own culture, and when you look at tobacco fields, you can see the tobacco drying sheds that become a part of the landscape. In order to harvest tobacco, it's incredibly um, labor-intensive. You have to crouch into the dirt to get the leaves, and it's a very leafy green plant, and it grows in iron-rich soils where other crops may not grow as well. Tobacco was shipped in hogsheads or casks and then sold to potential buyers at auctions or um, through vendors or given to people to settle debts. Tobacco marks appear on many ledgers and each mark was uh, unique to the buyer or seller. People had different tobacco marks depending on where their crop was being deposited. According to uh, the Great Britain system, the legal tender was both gold and silver, known as a bimetallic system, yet British coins were rarely seen in the colonies. The colonists had an unfavorable balance of trade with Great Britain, meaning that the value of the goods they imported from England greatly exceeded the value of goods exported back. This is because there wasn't as much industrialization in the United States at the time and what the United States was exporting was a lot of raw goods. Co or colonists did not have access to domestic gold or silver discoveries at the time. So in order to have a functioning economy, the colonists were forced to turn to other commodities for use as money. Spanish coins from trade with the West Indies and Mexico circulated freely in the colonies as legal tender. 
While goods were officially valued in British pounds, in their day-to-day -day transactions, colonists more commonly used the Spanish dollar as their unit of account. The Spanish coin was known as pieces of eight, and it was the most common coin in circulation throughout the colonies. But these coins were still too rare for the needs of the American economy, and it was very valuable to ship these coins to England for payment. From 1643 to 1660, wampum, which were shells prized by local Native American tribes that could be sewn into clothing or belts, were legal tender in Massachusetts. So while today historians are keen to argue that the Native Americans um, and the colonists did not work together, this is not true. Massachusetts colony was promoted in its development by felicitating trade using wampum, but it was the British who did not approve of this monetary system and they ended the practice in 1660. Throughout the 17th century, colonists in Virginia and North Carolina employed tobacco leaves as commodity money. In an effort to address the problem of durability in dried tobacco leaves, they substituted tobacco warehouse receipts for the actual tobacco. These receipts were like promissory notes. They recorded the value of tobacco stored in warehouses for later sale. Since the bearer of the receipt had a claim on that exact amount of tobacco, the receipts circulated like currency, but tobacco receipts couldn't be devised, or they couldn't be divided, and the supply of both tobacco and wampum in circulation could fluctuate wild, widely because they were based on natural resources, and this made them inadequate stores of value year to year. Lacking a viable commodity to use as money, local colonial governments of the 18th century turned to paper money. Paper money could take one of two forms. Commodity-backed paper money was similar to the tobacco warehouse receipts. The value of the paper was directly equivalent to and convertible into a specific amount of assets, such as gold, silver, or tobacco. Or land. During the 18th century, several colonial governments created land offices whose purpose was to issue paper money backed by real estate. Colonists could take out loans using their own land as collateral receiving paper notes of the land office in return. These notes circulated in the local economy as currency. Borrowers could pay back their loans plus interest to these banks with the paper money or with gold or silver. I don't believe the banks accepted tobacco as payment, although some of them may have in Virginia and North Carolina. In the failure to pay resulted in the foreclosure of their land, which could then be sold to pay off the loan, much like foreclosures on homes today. In the mid-Atlantic colonies of Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, Delaware, where land offices were most successful, the interest from these loans provided colonial governments with adequate funds for the day-to-day -day costs of government administration, lessening and sometimes even eliminating the necessity of taxation. If you ever look at the coastal towns on the eastern shores of Virginia or North Carolina or Maryland, you will often see a tax office building. And this building was so boats coming into these colonies would pay, um, and it was essentially a tariff system. So it was incredibly important for the colonists to not pay taxes. And we know that the tax system exploded with the Boston Tea Party in the American Revolution, but American colonists were not interested in paying taxes in the 1600s and 1700s. The other type of paper money is fiat money, meaning that its value is solely based on faith in the issuing party rather than on any concrete asset, and we get into fiat money discussions when America left the gold standard. During the 18th century, several colonial governments issued fiat money in payment for goods and services, encouraging the citizens to put their faith in the government. This printing of fiat money was often in response to increased military expenses, and so the government needed to cover their debts. It wasn't like today where we buy and sell debt to other countries. 
American colonists were willing to accept this money partially because they had no other alternative. Yet the government also promised its citizens to accept these same notes in payment for future taxes. And so the government pledged an uh, adequate um, filing system. The notes often circulated freely throughout the colony, easing the monetary problems of the region and facilitating trade until they were retired or removed from circulation at some future point as they arrived back in the colonial treasury in payment for taxes. Although British officials tried to ban this very um, self-sufficient method in the colonies with their currency acts of 1751 and 1764, they were only met with limited success. Some colonial legislatures did act irresponsibly, issuing fiat money well in excess of future receipts, printing new notes before earlier paper money issues had been collected and destroyed, and or failing to include a specific date or means for retirement of the money in their filing system. This resulted in price inflation and depreciation of the currency. Colonists would lose faith in the future value of the money, and so they were less willing to accept it in payments for goods and services at face value, and they would return to bartering because they knew that they wouldn't really have as much inflation or um, future worries with that system. Tobacco is tough on soil. Because of the intense tillage needed to get the land ready for transplanting and the lack of cover left in the fields after harvest, tobacco is potentially one of the most erosive cropping systems. The United States Department of Agriculture is incredibly concerned uh, about erosion in American fields and levies huge punishments on American farmers if there is erosion in their fields, even if their fields are mixed. If all of their wheat has no erosion, for example, but their tobacco does, the USDA will withhold grants and other federal money. Because of the intense tillage, um, it is much more difficult to meet erosion reduction goals with tobacco in the rotation of crops than it is with other crops. In Kentucky, for example, there can be a big rain right after the tobacco is set or when preparing the land, and so the soil ends up like flour, and that results in erosion. One has to remember that for North Carolina and Virginia, tobacco was one of the main exports until the federal government started to get involved and, and started to really push back on tobacco farmers. And so the small uh, farmer in these states really suffered and universities today from the University of Central Florida to the University of Kentucky pretty much acknowledge that these tobacco farmers, these old school tobacco farmers don't exist anymore. Um, tobacco production can end up losing as much as 24 tons of soil per acre just because the tobacco is so hard on the soil. Regardless of this, the system of tobacco as currency worked extremely well for the colonists. They were able to rely on a naturally reproducing system that required skill and intelligence and it's interesting to see the way that colonists were able to manipulate the tobacco to make sure that tariffs were in place so that American colonists could be put first in their own financial system.